devoted so much of your adult life to this kind of activism. What specifically and at what moment did you trigger into this action, whereby you get up from California and your home and you move to Washington to do this? I can tell you exactly. It was Labor Day weekend, and I was reading Naomi Klein's new book called On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal. And I was hearing Greta Thunberg, the Swedish climate striker, and it really hit me how urgent this issue is and that I wasn't doing enough. You know, I drive an electric car, I recycle, I've gotten rid of plastics, but that's a good starting place. It's not a good finishing place. This is a collective crisis, requires collective action. And so I decided to use my celebrity to try to raise the sense of urgency and I moved to Washington and I'm going to get arrested every Friday. Every Friday. Well, I'm going to ask you, and of course, Greta Thunberg, we're very proud to have interviewed her on this show. Naomi Klein has no. been on this program as well. But let me ask you, because you, I think, mentioned that the new type of arrest, i.e. these plastic, uh, these plastic ties that you were arrested with are very different from the metal handcuffs that you endured uh, in previous protests, and that you know, you are 82 or so, and it's kind of difficult to navigate uh, into the back of a police van without your arms. That's the least of it. You know, you've been, you've been talking about the Syrian crisis and the terrible situation that's happened there. That war, I am told, began because of the terrible drought that happened there. I mean, there is so much going on in the world and over it all is this ticking time bomb. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Crisis told us last year that we only have, well, last year they said 12 years, now it's 11 years. We have 11 years left to try to turn this fossil fuel disaster around so that we don't completely past the tipping point and it becomes untenable, untenable to govern, untenable to have a stable economy or any kind of human rights or anything. It's There's just going to be one disaster on top of the other. But we do have time. We have time and it's going to require that people in every country all around the world organize and mobilize and if necessary, bring governments to a to a halt if we can't make them do the right thing. I mean, it wouldn't have to be this radical and fundamental if the fossil fuel industry hadn't lied to us for 30 years. They knew 30 years ago that they were hurting the environment and they knew what the implications were and they lied and hoodwinked us. If we had started doing what needed to be done 30 years ago, it could have been an incremental transition away from fossil fuels. And now it's it's... This is an urgent crisis and we have to move very, very fast. Uh, All the while taking great care that the families and communities and workers who depend on the fossil fuel industry for their livelihood are going to be not just trained for the new jobs, but paid union wages with benefits and overtime and social security and everything that they need to support families and to live properly. We, we have to be very, very sure that those workers are taken care of. Let, let me just ask you uh, quickly to talk about the radical nature of this. You said, you know, it wouldn't have had to have been so radical if, uh, and, and, and you said what, you know, the reasons. I wonder whether you can reflect on whether there's a difference today between how you were treated and your generation of activists, whether they were for Native American rights or for women's rights or for, you know, the peace protests during the Vietnam War, for anti-apartheid or all of, all of those major anti-nukes, for instance. It seems that the climate activists, the younger ones, and I've had Extinction Rebellion activists on my program, they, they're getting arrested and taken to court in a way that they weren't in previous years. The court process is different. They're getting trolled online. Greta Thunberg is getting trolled in person and denigrated online. I mean, they're being really attacked in a, in a visceral way. Why do you think that's happening? What has changed, but, you know, since when you were what doing it as a younger person? We are, yeah, we're speaking to the very, foundations of our economic structure. You know, our economy and much of the world's economy is based on 
fossil fuel. And what we are saying is that has to change. I mean, change is coming, whether we want it or not. Change is coming either by disaster or by plan. And what is kind of beautiful is that we now have a plan, a vision for how to move forward and save ourselves. It's called a Green New Deal. And one of the reasons that I'm doing what I'm doing in Washington is to call attention to the Green New Deal, what it means and what it's going to take to get this turned into a reality. And what's so beautiful about it is that it's a win-win situation for everybody except the fossil fuel industry. And they're going to fight it tooth and nail. And that's why we're being arrested and taken to court and treated differently is because we are saying capitalism, the way it has been working for decades, isn't going to continue working if we keep it the way it is. We can we can make the changes within the framework of capitalism, but it's got to be a changed capitalism, a regulated capitalism, a humane capitalism. And so obviously the people whose wealth is threatened by that, and they're very, very, very powerful, and they've bought off a whole lot of the government in our country and in other countries, are going to fight with every single thing they have, and they have the power. The only thing is there's more of us, and so we have to be very determined, very organized, very prepared, understand what we're up against, and not give up. You know, back in the 30s when FDR had the New Deal here in the United States to try to save America from the terrible depression, people called, called him a communist and a socialist, and they there were bankers that tried to overthrow him. And the reason that he did it is because people were in the streets. And he knew that if he didn't do it, he'd be facing a full-out revolution. And so he slowly rolled out a Green New Deal that turned out to be so popular with average working people that it worked. And we got Social Security and millions of jobs and all kinds of great infrastructure improvements. And that's... Take the Green New Deal on steroids. It's going to be bigger, it's going to be greener, and it's going to be fairer because the New Deal left out farmers and women and African Americans, and the Green New Deal won't do that. So let me ask you then, because you are in Washington and you're coming to us with a background of the United States Capitol behind you, um, and you have the celebrity, the prominence, and the record to actually talk to the people in power. Um, are you going to be doing that? Uh, and who? Because you're not going to be preaching to the converted. You know that the Democrats um, believe in this. They have got this proposal for a Green New Deal. Many of the uh, new congresswomen, particularly uh, the Democratic candidates for president. Who do you think you, Jane Fonda, can target or, I mean, talk to? And are you planning to? Yes, I'm, we're going to be having conversations on the Hill. You know, what, what we're focusing on is the people who feel that individual lifestyle choices to reduce carbon footprint is, is enough. We want to take those people and move them into a more active column. Those, that's our target for these actions that we're doing. But we are going to be talking to Congress people. But the most important thing is, you see, this is going to be one, not not necessarily just through elections, but through mobilization and civilian action. But this this coming election next November is obviously critical. So we're urging people to vote for climate. We're, we're telling people, don't vote for any candidate that doesn't support the Green New Deal, understand what it is, and wouldn't want to implement starting on day one. I want to ask you a question, and I'm not bringing this up just to bring up Vietnam again or to bring up that picture or anything like that. But I want to ask you, because a lot of people get their backs up about, they say, don't lecture to me about my lifestyle. Uh, this is my right to eat, you know, hamburgers or, or drive a big fat car or do whatever the heck I want to do, have the air conditioning on so high that, you know, it's at crazy, unacceptable levels. About Vietnam, you said, it hurts me and it will to my grave that I made a huge, huge mistake that made a lot of people think that I was against the soldiers, about that famous picture of you with the anti-aircraft gun. So. What are, you, what are you facing? What sort of reaction have you had to, to, to you now taking this public stance? And what can you say to people today who are getting their backs up? 
saying, don't you lecture me on how to live my life and change my, my lifestyle. Well, I'm, I'm, I, know, I know that they're out there, especially in America, a land of individualism, which is one of the problems, by the way, um, don't like to hear things like um, we have to change a lot of what now exists in this country. But the whole middle of the country has been flooded. California is on fire. There, I mean, this isn't something we're talking about might happen in the future. We're in the middle of it. We're experiencing it right now. And so more and more people are understanding that it's an urgent crisis and that we have to band together to do something about it.